everybody, and welcome to Book Break. Today I am joined by my fellow librarian, Mindy, and we are going to delve into nonfiction November. So, I, Mindy, do you read a lot of nonfiction? I know you love history and... Pretty much lately, it's been exclusively nonfiction, except for the very few fiction books I've read for this podcast. Okay. So, yeah. And you like certain time periods, correct? I do. It's more topic wise too though. It's always been about like where's the women in history. Okay. So right now I seem to be on a medieval kick. Yeah. So but I'm brushing up against the part where they start to run out of sources for women. So I might have to get into some archaeological books soon. Okay. And look into those interpretations too. But yeah, right now it's the the fifteenth century for me. All right. And and I am going to be more in modern day here, so we're gonna be contrasting a little bit. Oh, we sure will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um I love history, so I'm gonna be really interested. And I know you and I have talked about one of the books that you're bringing today. But um yeah, I will I will jump right in then. My first one was a book that I read for book club here at the library, mm -hmm. and it was called Made. Hard Work, Low Pay, and a Mother's Will to Survive by Stephanie Land. Mm -hmm. And some people may be familiar with this because I believe it's a series on Netflix right now oh, as it? well. Um, but it was, it was an interesting kind of memoir. Uh, Stephanie is 28 years old. She becomes unexpectedly pregnant, um, so she's not going to go to college like she planned. She had an abusive ex-boyfriend, which she's living kind of near so he can have visitations with his daughter. And she's struggling with income, housing, and everything. And it really just brings home how many, like, if you have something bad happen in your life, like, if you don't have a support net of family and friends, you're pretty much screwed, unfortunately. Things um, can go south very quickly. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are government programs, but unless you know how to access things, you know, you could be left in the dark as And with that's that. very time consuming too. Yes. To know the resources and, and have the wherewithal to apply to all those and follow up with everybody because right. you know how fast bureaucracy works and... Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this was interesting because she you know, she does find a place to live. She does find some advocates within the community that help her out, but she starts working as a maid. So part of it is her stories of just how hard it is to break that cycle of poverty mm -hmm. and eventually get an education, but also how we treat people that are kind of in the lower rungs of our society. Um, and some of it was really sad, like some of the comments she would get at the grocery store when she would use her, you know, WIC checks or whatever that, oh, I paid for that, you know, and some mm. of the other things. Um, but it was it was interesting. She kind of annoyed me a little bit um, just because I'm thinking, OK, you're 28 years old. You know, <laughs> this is not like you're 18. So I would have liked to have seen some reflection on her own life choices and how she got to this situation. Oh. And her mother lived, like, overseas with someone. You know, she had married someone other than Stephanie's father and had moved on. Mm -hmm. So they were not supportive. But it was sad to me that you have a parent that has money that is not helping in any way. Um, that was, it was just really frustrating. And, and not everybody's parents or family are supportive. But um, she is writing another book because she... It does end on a positive note, like she does end up going to college, and the next book that she's writing is called Class, oh. so I think it's going to be her journey. Like She she wanted to go to a college in Montana, I believe. Um, she was on the like Pacific West Coast somewhere, I think state of Washington or Oregon or somewhere. I can't remember exactly right now, but um, I'm still- Was she experiencing the housing crisis, too, with the- Oh, the high well, prices. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, so many investors are buying properties that it's mm -hmm. making it almost impossible for regular people to buy houses mm -hmm. or any kind of affordable houses, particularly for someone that is looking for a first time home. Mm -hmm. I think, Sean, didn't you go through that too with like trying to buy a house and you constantly get outbid or? That's a whole separate podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> to no, be continued. It, I mean, yeah, it's. I think it's affecting so many people. Yeah, even but. renting. I mean, I hear stories about how difficult it is to find affordable places to rent. Too. Right. So I this book was a, a pretty quick read. Um, I think mm-hmm. it does bring up a lot of things, even though you may not agree with all of her decisions, because some of her decisions in my mind were a bit questionable. Mm-hmm. But it still is very eye-opening as to what it would take if you ran upon some extreme bad luck or, you know, mm-hmm. you know, for someone of this age. So, Well, I hope that reaches a wide variety of audiences and maybe some people will look at their own perspective a little bit differently. Right. How or they even treat the other perspective people. of how you treat other people. How you treat other people. Right. That yeah. may, um, may or may not be justified. Looks Pro- like the follow-up is going to be November 7th, 2023. Yes. yes. It's coming out very soon. So oh, Perfect timing, Claire. Perfect timing. Mm-hmm. Right. So read made and then jump in and read class when mm-hmm. it comes in. But yeah, I think I am going to read the sequel because I'm I'm interested to see like where her life is going mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, her young daughter, which I applaud her for keeping her child and trying to do what's best. But that was the other thing is finding childcare. I was going to ask if she covered that at all because oh, that yeah. can be they were referring that was to like the child care council, but everybody is flooded with requests. Right. There's not enough funding to go around. So you can't work if you don't have child care. Yeah. And it, it really just perpetuates that. Right. It's a catch-22. It really is. Yeah. It really is. So you can have every intention of trying to get yourself back up on your feet, and you just cannot without that support system. Yeah. And I think that's why she worked odd hours at being a maid, because, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. her ex-husband or other people that she knew could watch her daughter while she worked these kind of weird, fluky hours. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, very interesting. So what have you got for us delving into another time and century? Well, before we move into mine, I just wanted to say that that reminds me a lot of that Julia, Julie Julia book. Oh, okay. I don't okay. know if you read that or Yeah, is or that not? the one with she, she cooked the blog? Off? Yes. Yes, yes. With Julia Childs. Yep, and how she kind of talked about her own life decisions and, mm-hmm. and progressed from that. I did not like the sequel as much as I liked the first one, so I okay. hope you like class as much as you liked The Maid. Yeah, so, I hope so too. Yeah. But jumping into mine, we're winding about 500 years. <laughs> so I read a series of books um, about the war of the Wars of the Roses, and I do get into like the Tudors and the White Queen and the Princess and the Spanish Princess and all those. Um, but I get really bogged down in the historical inaccuracies, so I have a hard time separating out that that didn't really happen. And then I start yelling at the TV like I'm watching a football game, and it's <laughs> yeah, my family loves it when I do that. So, but I read um, two books by Alison Weir. The first one was called Lancaster and York, and that was published in twenty or two thousand nine, and um, so it actually starts really early in the conflict she lays the groundwork for about a hundred years before it happens oh wow yeah so that was a bit difficult to follow so and of course everybody's named Richard and Elizabeth and it's (laughs) really hard to keep everybody straight and but she does a a nice job of being consistent Mm -hmm. because I've read other historians works where they'll refer to the person by the title that they hold at that time so you could have somebody who's you know York but then he's like the Earl of Chester or somebody and you have to keep in mind that this is all the same person okay Alison Weir does a really great job with consistency and laying out who is who but um, perhaps she didn't need to start with the deposition of Richard II in the 1300s to lay the groundwork for something that started in 1455. But, you know, it was helpful to have that background information, just, you know, maybe not 20 hours of it Mm -hmm. in the, in the audio book that I read. So, but she talked about the major players. So starting with Richard II getting deposed by Henry Bolingbroke and that led to the Lancaster family taking over and, um, So it was really challenging and where to begin with because everybody's so arbitrary about when these dates are for the Wars of the Roses. Some people set it for the Battle of St. Albans in 1455. She sets it with the deposition of Richard II. Okay. So. And the... The roses of York are white, correct? And yes, then, they are. Yes. Yep, and Lancaster is red. And I actually did some notes about that because I can never keep straight when they have, when they came up with that whole Wars of the Roses mm-hmm. phraseology. So there was a scene in Shakespeare 
where they plucked the rose in the garden, and that was very iconic. But the Wars of the Roses actually came from Sir Walter Scott in his 1829 novel, Anne of Gerstein. So is where he started talking about the Wars of the Roses. They actually called it the Cousins War. Okay. So very, very much not as dramatic, I, I would say. Yeah. So... All I, I remember many, many, well, a long time ago, when after I got out of college, I went to England, and I did like a three-week tour, and I was in York, and the Queen was visiting York, and I was watching the, you know, TV news that night, and a child gave her a bouquet of red roses, and she was like, what? Red roses <laughs> from York? You know, she was, you know, acted like she was stunned. So nice. I figured nice. that was not not a popular, you know, or not the appropriate thing or typical Probably thing. Probably not. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, I am so jealous. I would have loved to have spent three weeks touring England. And did you actually see the Queen? Like, I, I saw a glimpse of her, like, driving by, but oh, I, I didn't. Oh, close enough. You yeah. occupied the same space. I for, occupied we, the space, but yes. I didn't actually see her. Oh, that's amazing, Claire. Yeah. That is wonderful. It really was. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's so much symbolism in, in British history, too. I try to read books on heraldry and, you know, the arms and all that, but it's just, it's overwhelming trying to keep everything straight and what means what family. I'm just in awe that that's how they used to identify each other mm -hmm. on battle. They'd just be like, oh, I know that flag and, you know, don't hurt that person that he's wearing that special sign or whatever. It's so right. overwhelming that they kept all of that straight and how offended they would get if you like you made an an, an error making their shield too and if there was any kind of taint of illegitimacy they would um note that on the shield too so just knowing what to look for oh is really fascinating calling you out on your oh, family lineage on yeah, your shield with a, with a good old slash on on your shield or or something along those lines but yeah there was a way to um to identify whether or not it was an illegitimate line oh my gosh yeah anyone watch knight's tale <laughs> yeah it was Heath Ledger. Heath. Yep. I yeah, I loved that movie. Oh, that was good. He was a great actor. Yeah, yeah. that was that was. I'm sure that wasn't like a hundred, you know, accurate or whatever. But it was very fun. It kind of set during that time period. Nice. But. Yeah, yeah. So I highly recommend Lancaster, New York. Not a big fan of how they portrayed um, Elizabeth Woodville, who is the commoner who married Edward the Fourth. Okay. They described her as avaricious, greedy, glacial beauty, and and um, just ruthless. And oh. I don't really know about that part of it. But there is a, a nice legend that she um, came across Edward the Fourth seated under the Queen's Oak in England with her two young sons and she begged him to restore her deceased husband's property because he fought for the wrong side and she lost everything and um, sources say that that didn't really happen um, but she um, she did meet him at some point she did convince him to marry her and um, and not pursue an unmarried relationship so um, she became queen of England and she brought her very large family with her and that was not a popular move Nobody really wanted to marry into the Woodville clan, but there was like 13 kids. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, everybody had a Woodville spouse. So, yeah, fascinating book. There's so much detail in here. Wow. I will have to read some of that. That sounds interesting. It was. So we're going to we jump next. forward again. Um, and this time, I, I think almost everybody would know this person even if they're not avid basketball fans but this book is lebron mm -hmm. and it was by jeff benedict i think but um this was really fascinating to me because it really starts with lebron's story as a child mm -hmm. and when you realize the background where he came from it's mind-blowing to see where he is right now um, LeBron's mother had him when she was 16 years old. They lived a very transient lifestyle. Um, I think when he was in fourth grade, they said he missed close to 100 days of school. Uh -huh. um, so his mom was finally desperate enough. He started playing different sports, and one of his coaches recognized his natural talent uh -huh. and offered to let him live with he and his family. And 
his mom didn't really want to give him up Mm -hmm. because they would be on people's couches and I believe her own mother died. So her family Mm -hmm. support system started to go awry, Mm -hmm. but um, she did let him go. And that was the stabilizing force to let him really start his life. So the, the thing that blew my mind is when he got to high school, he was in high school and he was on the cover of sports illustrated and, That's a pretty iconic cover if you've ever seen it with him. Mm -hmm. Um, But his high school team was outfitted by Adidas. He went to a Catholic high school in Akron, Ohio. Mm. Um, He started winning every accolade possible, and he was drafted right out of high school into the NBA. So here you have this 18-year-old kid who is trying to decide between Nike, Adidas, um, different shoe companies, apparel companies. I mean, and they're flying him and his mother and trying to get them to do stuff and make the decisions. So I really give him a lot of credit for not losing his head Mm. and totally like wasting and blowing everything. Um, And he did have like this group of friends from high school that he kept – with him throughout his life. Like he would pick certain people and just kind of keep them close to him. Mm. Um, Like his wife was his high school sweetheart. Mm. So, you know, um, and he has three children. Um, The thing I really liked is he formed a school after he got famous and had a lot of money. So Mm. he's really trying to give back to that community. Um, They have like lunch programs so the children don't go hungry or breakfast or in, in addition to supplying, like, everything they need for school. But I just was f- amazed at what he, you know, he won to the Olympics. He brought a championship to Cleveland. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you're not a basketball fan, to read about his life is, it was like I was turning the pages, like it was a page turn. It sounds like he had a huge humanitarian impact yeah. on his community, too. Yes, definitely. Um so yeah, to have to go from high school to the pros and still remain pretty much normal. Um, and what a hard decision for his mom to make too. I mean, I, I give her a lot of credit. Yeah, that took a lot of strength. Right. To do that. Yep. To to be able to know that that's what he needed. Yeah. But, do you um, remember the drama back around 2010, 11, when he left the Cavaliers to go to the Heat? Yes. And how, like, you would have thought the president was being impeached. Right. You know? Well, and he almost received, like, death threats and everything from people. I mean, the blowback from that decision. Was it considered a step down in his career? Well, he's from Cleveland. He's from Akron. So that was a big, you know, it it, it felt like a betrayal to those. Oh, and they took it personally. Oh, very. Yeah. Yeah, huh. it was such a big deal, and I remember being on tour at the time. Oddly After all enough. he did for the community, too, they didn't stand by him. No, and it was weird. One of his like managers or something at the time, and he, he actually said that was a huge mistake on his mm-hmm. part, is they held like this press conference yeah. where they were going to release the decision Ooh. as to who. <laughs> they, really, they really dialed it up. Yeah. Yeah. And um <laughs> they got more flack and heat from that. Wow. And then um Miami got him, mm-hmm. Dwayne Wade. Mm-hmm. Who was the other guy? The Iverson. Time, yeah, maybe. I can't remember. I don't know. But anyway, got they got head, like but... three superstars yeah. and then they won like several They won three. Yeah, three championships. Yeah. Wow. Um or two at least. And yeah, yeah, and then he went back to Cleveland. Right. He went back to Cleveland. How was he? And received? then he won oh they yeah. they were happy, yeah. and okay. he won them a championship. Yeah. So they finally won <laughs> okay. a national championship in Cleveland. Yeah. That is one thing I'm so angry about is my son went to school in Cleveland, and I really wanted to go to see LeBron play. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, Just never happened. It did not happen. Lucky. So, and now he's in Los Angeles, still playing. Yeah, he's 38. Yeah, 38 oh. years old. How long do basketball players usually play? Until the ACL says no more. 
Pre- pretty much. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. So kind of similar. To I think football. he was. Yeah. They said himself. that he was hoping to play with his son. So we will see if that really happens. Yeah, as Bronny. We, yeah, his one son is in. Mm. He's an All American, also. Right. Yeah. College in California. But can you imagine the pressure of being LeBron's son? I don't. I don't know if I could do that. I hope he's doing it because he wants to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess it's all on how you frame it. Yeah. yeah. But um. Yeah, and he, you know, isn't afraid to, you know, he does do some things politically, but I think he's very careful about picking mm-hmm. and choosing what his causes are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, very interesting book. Even if you're not a 100% sports fan, I, I feel like he's one of the iconic people of probably the last 50 years. So, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, LeBron. <laughs> he definitely sounds like a, a good mentor for kids to look up to. Yeah. Yeah. I hope. I hope they don't dig up anything <laughs> on him. Let's hope not. One but, never knows. Yeah. But. Indeed. Well, this podcast will get a whole lot more interesting if they do. <laughs> yes, this is true. <laughs> so what is your next book, oh, Mindy? My next book was published in 20, or sorry, yeah, 2014. It's Elizabeth of York. So continuing with my Wars of the Roses theme. Um, so it, it focuses on... Elizabeth, who is the daughter, the firstborn daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. And she was the older sister of the princes in the tower. Oh. Um, yes. So um, that unfortunate, really sad, tragic mystery, whatever happened, they never really uncovered anything definitive. I guess Henry VII and Richard III never really said anything about what happened to them. And there was a bunch of pretenders and impersonators after. So they're really, because there was no body, there was no crime. So they um, they couldn't definitively prove that the princes were dead or not. But they took Elizabeth of York. They made her legitimate again because they had made her illegitimate for Richard III to get on the throne. So Elizabeth of York is now legitimate. She can marry Henry VII. She does that after the Battle of Bosworth. Um, He makes sure to get crowned first, and he makes sure to predate his reign before the Battle of Bosworth. So everybody who fought against him were traitors, and he could benevolently forgive everybody. And um, she has to put up with his overbearing mother, Margaret Beaufort, who is how Henry inherited the crown. She was um, a descendant of John of Gaunt through... um, his marriage with Catherine Swinford. And um, that was also an illegitimate line. They were supposed to never inherit the throne, but they did some kind of legal magic and um, and they could inherit the throne again. So Margaret was actually the heir, but because she was a woman, they overlooked it and, and her claim passed to her son. And she just poured everything she had into fostering her son um, and his career and his just having him survive, which was amazing because he was seen as such a threat when he was younger and he had to go into exile a few mm-hmm. times. And um, I think it's remarkable that he even survived childhood because she was only 13 when he was born. Oh, dear. So and he was a posthumous son for Edmund Tudor. So um, so she and that was her only child was Henry Tudor. And he lived in France for a number of years. And Is that Henry VIII's father? Yes. Okay. Well, that's that's his big claim to fame, although he may not have realized that at that time. <laughs> no, but um, and he, Henry VII was mostly seen as a miser, um, but there is, and there's no letters that survive between him, from him to Elizabeth of York, but they believe that he was faithful to her, he did um, kind of have a flirtation with the wife of one of the impersonators to the throne who was Scottish royalty. Um, and they're basing that on just, you know, he bought her some pretty clothes. And they're like, oh, he must, you know, he must want her as his mistress. Um, but Elizabeth of York had Arthur, who who died young after he married Catherine of Aragon. She had Henry VIII. And then she had two daughters, Margaret Tudor, who became the Queen of Scotland, and um, Mary Tudor, who married the King of France. And then she went on to cause scandal, and she married the Duke of Suffolk. Oh wow! And um, and Mary's the one who um, the Jane Grey line came from. The Nine Days. How queen. do you keep all this in your head? I have no life. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's impressive. This is my this is my geeking out. This yeah. is what I can just expound on for. It's incredible. You know, my mom's into this too, and she oh, really? knows it all. Well, Ooh, not, your mom not, and I should have tea sometime. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, probably. 
<laughs> Poor Sean here, guys. Well, Sorry you said that. Isn't the, the rule of succession, wasn't that just recently changed? It was for Catherine Middleton's daughter. Yes. Yeah. So so that the son, Louis, did not um He will not supersede. pass her. Exactly. So Princess Charlotte would, you know, although now it's it's more like... What do they call it? figurehead monarchy? So it's not like they're really ruling. Yeah, but it's a, until they rule, not now, reign, they reign that, that, rule. that rule has stood. Yeah. So in other words, if Elizabeth II had had a brother, we wouldn't have seen her. Yep. 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 He would have become king. Yeah. Yeah. And in France, they make a big deal about the Salic Law, too. And that dates back to the time where um, Elizabeth, Isabella of France, she was the queen in Braveheart or the princess in Braveheart. Her brother died without a male issue. And they kind of created their own situation there because the one who said a woman can't inherit the throne inherited the throne and then didn't have a son to pass it to. Oh, interesting. And then the Hundred Years' War started. So, and then they just kind of clung to that, the Salic law, no, no women can inherit the throne, but they can pass their claim down to their, their male descendants. Huh. So, but yeah, Elizabeth York, super interesting book, a lot of, um, a lot of detail in there, a lot, I, I read it a couple of times just to, to try to absorb all the details of it too, but I give her a lot of credit with how she handled, you know, Richard the third getting defeated at Bosworth because there was talk about her actually going on to marry him um and they were not sure how that was going to work if she was considered illegitimate and she was also you know re closely related it was an uncle niece marriage which was pretty frowned upon but they were looking into getting a dispensation but that didn't happen after bosworth and she married henry the seventh and um margaret richmond or margaret beaufort the countess of richmond sounded like a real character every time in public she would wear her countess coronet and just <laughs> <laughs> she signed herself Margaret R and kind of insinuating Margaret Regina. Okay. But she said it was Margaret Richmond and you know, she was really um playing the part of the Queen Dowager while there was an actual Queen Dowager at court. And and the Queen Dowager, Elizabeth Woodville, ended up um going to an abbey in Bermondsey. So because Henry the Seventh wanted her income to go oh. to support his wife. Okay. So this is Alison Weir also? Yes. Okay. Yep. So it was interesting in that between um, 2009 and 2014, she seemed to have changed her tune a little bit about mm -hmm. Elizabeth Woodville. There was less of that glacial beauty, ruthlessness, <laughs> avarice, and more of, um, you know, she was a good example for Elizabeth of York. And, you know, she was a commoner, but she really knew how to behave like a queen. So I just, I found that really fascinating. Now, have you read any of the companion fiction novels that Alison Weir has written? I like tried, but my memory <laughs> is so... Because I found that I would absorb the fiction details and think they were real. And okay. I had a really hard time separating them out. So I was like, I, I can't. Had to put on. those down? <laughs> I did. Because I, I don't want to be like, especially if like I'm, t I'm talking to like on a podcast and I start saying something that I think is true and I read it in a novel. And right. Yeah. That You're would be embarrassing. Record. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to walk that back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Elizabeth of York by Alison Weir. Well, that sounds very interesting. I know she has written a lot of um, of books, and she does she just go strictly in sequence? Like, no? She started with The Princess in the Tower, and then she was like, huh, I should write a prequel. And then she wrote Lancaster in okay. York. And then she's like, well, there's a lot of sources on Elizabeth of York, and we really should explore her some more. Okay. So So she yeah. just started, and it just went from there. Okay. My last one is These Precious Days by Ann Patchett, and it is a book of essays. Um, essays are the nonfiction equivalent of short stories. Mm -hmm. So if you're the kind of person that likes to pick up, read a little story, put it down, I recommend this. Her essays are probably one of the best I've read, and they're very personal, and you might know some of the people that mm -hmm. she's talking about. One, her own family is very interesting. Um, Ann Patchett is prolific fiction author, has a bookstore in Nashville, which I visited recently oh, wow. and absolutely loved. But um, she talks a lot about her choice to remain childless, mm -hmm. even though she's married. And it's amazing how many people will continue to ask you about that, even, mm -hmm. even though, you know, it's not their business. So 
that was a very interesting essay. But the one that really summed up the book is she met Tom Hanks. He actually narrated one of her audiobooks. Oh, cool. And his assistant, and she became close to the assistant. And during the right before the pandemic, the assistant became ill, and Ann Patchett. She was supposed to be visiting a hospital there in Nashville. And she said, why don't you just come and stay with us? Wow. Which was great. And then the pandemic happened. They stayed for a while. So she was there for a while. Wow. Um, and this friendship kind of expanded. And she talks about having to deal with the illness at that time. Like she had cancer. Wow. And how their friendship developed. And it was really, at, at times it was so funny. And other times you were almost ready to cry. Mm. But... um. I would highly recommend this book. Another um, one of her good friends is Kate D. Camillo, who wrote a lot of children's books. Mm -hmm. So there's an essay about her. Uh, Eudora Welty, who wrote a lot of short stories. So um, this was just really, really cool. Oh, and about her three different fathers. So, um, And there's a picture of them if you read the print book, like mm -hmm. a picture of her with her three fathers taken at... A wedding so was this a fairly quick read or yeah but it's a read that i kind of savored and mm. if you listen to the audio which is available on hoopla she reads it herself and she has a wonderful oh, I love voice when I do that yes yeah so um i highly recommend the audio version but this was one of the most popular choices of my book club nice. this past year and we haven't really typically read essays so mm. yeah i'll have to check that out right I recommend it. It's on our favorite bookshelf, too. Like, oh, very you know, good. the ones that patrons write what they put or think about. So, our thumbs Thanks. up shelf, I guess you could All say. Right. Good choice, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's your last one, Mindy? Last one's called The King's Grave. It was recently republished as The Lost King and made into a movie. And it's written from the dual perspective of a screenwriter who was the driving force behind the Finding Richard project in the car park in 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, she paired up with a historian, Michael Jones, to write the history part of it. So it tells a parallel story of, of uncovering Richard's body and, and doing the DNA testing and the reconstruction of, of all that and the reburial with what actually happened during the Wars of the Roses and the ends of the of the time Richard Battle of Bosworth and, and what he experienced there. And and then it just kind of nicely ties it all together at the end when they're looking at the skeleton and they're like, here are these battle wounds and then the historical sources that know what happened to the body after the battle. So it was, it was very interesting. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by the passion that Philippa Langley had for this project and mm -hmm. that, she was really the driving force behind it and to take on all these um, councils and laws and, you know, university archaeology departments and and really fight. And she talks about having to mortgage her house possibly to help raise funds for this. And she formed the Scottish branch of the Richard III Society and um, just, you know, that kind of no grass grew under her feet. She was just a force. That was the one thing I really enjoyed in that movie is when she was going to the Richard the Third Society. Mm -hmm. You know, they were some quirky folks. Yes, <laughs> there is a documentary too, and it um, and it shows them being Zoom interviewed about it when they were um, talking about whether or not he had scoliosis, and they were all like, "How do you get armor on over that?" And I'm like, "Well, how would you know? Like, what are your qualifications?" Um, and then they actually brought out somebody who had scoliosis and a similar curvature to the spine as Richard the Third, and they put. Armor on this guy yeah. and it was like see you can do it um but they said that how his his spine was curved though it wouldn't have been very visible under his clothes padded doublet would have hit it um but he would have been in a lot of pain all his life yeah. so i thought that was a really interesting thing to bring up just the psychological um aspect of of what he dealt with day in and day out and and what he went on to to do and contemporary sources say that he was a successful king um and and he was called beloved right after the battle of bosworth so there was a positive view of it until you know that the tudor propaganda took over and shakespeare and 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 it didn't look so good for him after that 
No, no. The Shakespeare play yes. really, I think, ruined his reputation. And then did you, with Laurence Olivier, too. Oh, yeah. that was so over the top when I watched that. Yeah. I was just, yeah. Yeah, yeah just no. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I liked The King's Grave a lot. It was a really um, readable book, and, and it had a lot of good sources in it. And yeah, and I um, can't really say that I'm a fan of the movie, but... I respect other people who like it and, you know, I'm glad that's that one are... where I read, I saw the movie uh, and I haven't read the book, but I want to read the book. And so. I did the other. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. I always have a hard time reading the book first and then seeing the movie and liking the movie after that. Right. Yeah. 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 So. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today, Mindy. Thank and you for listening to me go on about history. Yes. Delving into our nonfiction. So hopefully we talked about some books that will be interesting for you. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. Theme music composed and performed.